What I'm going to do tonight is uh, give you sort of an overview of the reversal of fortune in Brazil. Um, Brazil, as you know, is the bee in the bricks, uh, like Russia, India, China, and some say even South Africa. It's one of these significant developing countries, these middle-income countries, that has emerged as a significant player in the world. It is a, it is a country that is involved heavily uh, in the global economy. And this question of whether Brazil is a serious country is the, is the question that Brazilians ask themselves. And, and this goes back to a apocryphal, I will tell you, apocryphal story, but it's repeated constantly. There was a, a Brazilian president in the early 60s by the name of Jânio Quadros. Okay, he had been governor of the large industrial state of Sao Paulo. Quadros was well known as a drunkard. And so one day, uh, uh, the French president, Charles de Gaulle, a you know, great French leader, visited Brazil and supposedly, again, this is apocryphal, but it gets repeated for, for decades, uh, supposedly he went up to the lectern to speak, and just as he was going up to the lectern, Quadrus, who allegedly was drunk at the time, grabbed his backside and squeezed. Right? To touch the French president is sacrilegious, of course, and certainly back then, and to touch de Gaulle is even worse. De Gaulle, without missing a beat, took the, the microphone and uttered the infamous words, this is not a serious country. The Brazilian dignitaries, governors, diplomats, all laugh, they just guffaw, they love the question, is Brazil a serious country? I'm going to show you some evidence that suggests that it is a very serious country, although as Brazilianists, we tend to also think, well, maybe it, it's a country that takes uh, a step forward and takes half a step back, and, and we've, we've been frustrated by Brazil. A good friend of mine, Tim Power, who teaches political science at Oxford, loved the title of my new book, Brazil, A Reversal of Fortune, because he said, well, reversal of fortune can go both ways, so you're, you're covered uh, just in case. <laughs> Um, it goes the wrong way. All right, well, what's the evidence that Brazil may be a serious country? Well, you've probably read about these protests that occurred largely in June. Some of that uh, uh, came into July as well. There's some sporadic uh, mass protests in Brazil today. Um, Brazilianists have been scratching their heads for months now to find an explanation for this. Absolutely everybody was caught flat-footed. Nobody who knows anything about Brazil predicted this. Right? Why, did, why did these mass protests occur? Right? I have my own pet theory. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily the majority theory, but the pet theory is that if you look at the people who were engaged in these protests and still engage in these protests, they tend to be, but they're not exclusively, but they tend to be young college-educated Brazilians. These are educated people, and they're largely urban urbanites. Now, it's not, ice, it's not focused exclusively on the industrialized urban centers of the south and southeast, the most developed states of Brazil. Now, you've seen these protests also in the poorer states of the north and northeast, uh, but mostly in urban areas. And again, led mostly by young college-educated people. Um, so my, my going uh, explanation for this is that there is a crisis of rising expectations. Uh, and we're seeing some of this being played out in terms of these protest movements. See, Brazil has done a lot better in the past 10, 15 years than it did during the first 10 years after it made its transition to democracy in 1985. It had had a, a military government from 1964 until 1985. So 21 years of military rule with torture, uh, some disappearances, not as bad as Argentina and Chile and some of these other South American countries, but a lot of torture, uh, 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 certainly censorship. It was not an easy country to live in in the 1970s and early 1980s. The transition to democracy occurs in 1985, and a lot of things go wrong in Brazil. Probably one of the things you've heard about is hyperinflation. Um, I uh, was a student at the Catholic University in Rio back in 1990, and the, by the end of that year, uh, the national uh, annualized inflation rate was 3,000%. 3,000%. And what 3,000% inflation does is it just basically rips the social fabric entirely. You don't know the price of anything. You can't keep money in your pockets. Uh, you have to change into foreign currency, and only the rich and, and those that have access to foreign currency can do that. Um, so, Brazil has seen the worst of times, definitely. And in the last 10 years, particularly under the presidents that I'm going to talk about in just a couple of minutes, 
uh, the leaders of the Workers' Party, Lula, who you've probably uh, have read about, Lula da Silva, and the current president, Dilma Rousseff, uh, the first female president of Brazil, times uh, got much, much better. Uh, the economy began to grow. I'll show you some of those figures. Um, it's also become a more equal country. It's one of the most unequal countries in the world, but it's made progress in terms of inequality that's actually quite shocking quite shocking. Poverty levels have also fallen in a, in a way that, you know, it just doesn't happen in Brazilian history. And democracy arguably has gotten a bit better in terms of its quality in a variety of areas that I'm going to talk about. So why should these protests occur? Well, if you expect that things are better, you are offended when a whole lot of money is spent on soccer stadiums and not on hospitals and schools. Uh, in order to improve those things that Brazil needs to improve. It's got a crazy pension system. It's a very unequal access to pensions and Social Security. It has a very large informal labor market. Uh, and so young college-educated people who have nothing to lose, as many of you know, right? You, have, you don't have a lot of assets. Uh, you, you can afford to go out there and say, this is not right. Instead of spending $27 billion on soccer stadiums in preparation for the World Cup and eventually for the Olympic Summer Games in 2016, more of this money should be spent uh, on hospitals. Now, that's not to say that the Workers' Party hasn't spent a whole lot of money on social policy. In fact, I'm going to show you that that's been the case. Um, but Brazilians are not used to that. Right? So these large quantities of money that people talk about, 27, 30 billion dollars on soccer stadiums and, and urban infrastructure is a shock to many of these Brazilians. So there's this, 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 con, this, this tension that exists between the expectation that Brazil should be getting better and the reality that it's not getting better as fast as many of these people would like. So that's one of the explanations for these protests, but you probably have seen some of this. So is this serious? Yeah, this is pretty serious. Now let me talk about something that isn't so serious. Let me introduce you to Chiririca. Okay. Chiririca is a clown. He is. He's a clown. Um, he's a rich clown. Uh, he was very poor. Um, he's one of these hard scrabble stories in Brazil that just we, we just love. If you, if you think about Lula's life, Lula also was extremely poor and he became president of the republic. Um, Chiririca uh, was a clown who gained his own TV program and then decided that he wanted to go run for political office and gain a seat in the Congress in the lower house, the Chamber of Deputies. And he did. He was successful in 2002. Um, he's not just any federal deputy. He was the most voted for federal deputy in Brazilian history. He gathered more votes than anybody else. Nobody cares about his party. Um, people knew him, and so everybody focused on voting for him, Chiririca. Okay. One of the problems, one of the challenges of Brazil that sort of raises the question of whether it's a serious country, it's its political system. Uh, and I'm going to say more about that in greater detail. But suffice to say, and here's, the, here's one of the takeaway points that I want you to have in mind. The Brazilian political system is a system that rewards individual politicians for cultivating a personal vote. In other words, you campaign based on your personality, you campaign based on your ideas, not the ideas of a political party, not the platform of an organization. You have no incentives uh, to support a political party. Um, you're in it because you, know, uh, you have ideas, or you have a certain persona, or you have money. And money uh, tends to create um, you know, political families that support particular politicians and they gain access to power. Because the currency of Brazilian politics has always been access to the state. Um, so, and, and we call it something in American politics we used to call it, I think it's still called pork barrel, right? Pork barrel politics, pork. You put riders on bills and amendments and, and when we used to legislate. Uh, and you pass them and you get, you know, you get money for your bailiwick, for your, for your electoral district. Same thing happens in Brazil. And so you have a, a system that is highly personalistic. And so a clown like Chiririca can become the most uh, elected federal deputy in the history of a country. So let's take a, a little bit, a closer look at some of the system, some of the aspects of the political system that make it a serious country, but also suggest that maybe there are some unserious elements to it. One of the things that I'm going to emphasize here is this machine. This is an electronic voting machine in Brazil. You can actually go online and do a simulated vote uh, in Brazil. Um, all voting in Brazil uses electronic voting. 
And the cases of fraud have just plummeted since electronic voting has been, has been employed. Um, there aren't, uh, there are 26 different states in Brazil. There aren't 26 different electoral systems in Brazil as there are in the United States. There are 50 different electoral systems in the US, different rules concerning the ballot structure and all that. Some use a butterfly ballot, some use something else. Uh, it's standardized in Brazil, and there's a, there's a federal tribunal, there's a federal electoral court. It's actually quite common in federal countries in Latin America. And so the, the whole system is governed in a very professional way. The problem is, is that when you decide who to vote for, you have to know their, their name and you have to know their elect electoral number. Again, because the ballot is structured in such a way that you elect an individual rather than vote for a political party. Now, the ballot, the electronic ballot, does allow you to pick a party, but the vast majority of Brazilians don't identify with any political party. Vast majority. And you'll see later in, in just a moment that if there's any kind of partisan identification, it's identification with only one party, the Workers' Party. Because it's a true party. It's a party that's internally disciplined. It has a consistent ideology. Very important. And it has a figure, historically, that has brought the party together, and that's Lula. Okay. But that's a unique party in the Brazilian political system. And it's also a very unusual party, even in the context of Latin America. So all of these incentives, all of these structures, these institutions exist to cultivate a personal vote. Campaign finance, a third point up here. Um, much like the American system, the money doesn't go to political parties. It goes largely to individual politicians. Right? So one uh, phrase in Portuguese that you should, that you should think about is bom de voto. Bom de voto. Literally, it means good with the vote, good at gathering the vote. Bom de voto. And this is essentially a politician, and all political parties want these politicians right, on their team, because these are politicians like Chiririca who just attract votes. And those votes then determine shares of seats in the Chamber of Deputies. Right? And then there's a Senate in which individuals also cultivate a personal vote. So the whole political system, the Congress especially, and certainly the presidency, is oriented around the cultivation of a personal vote. And this last point, the distribution of resources in order to you know, get reelected. It's all about getting reelected. There are no term limits in Brazil, uh, except for the, for the presidency and only if you, have, if you want to pursue a third consecutive term. You can't do that. A, a non-consecutive term, yes, but not a consecutive term. So the political system is based on what you see in the cartoon. Here's, here's Jilma Rousseffi throwing fish to a seal with PMDB on it. The PMDB is the largest single party in the chamber. It's the party of the Brazilian democratic movement. Um, it has no identity whatsoever. It's what we would call a catch-all party. It has no ideology. It's generally a center-right party. But it's a party that has always supported the, gov the government. Whoever is in power, whether it's Lula, a leftist, or whether it's Fernando Henrique Cardoso, a center-rightist, or whether it's Fernando Collor, a rightist, or Sarney, a rightist, they always have supported it. There's another expression in Portuguese uh, that uh, si simply it means, if there's a government, I like it. Right? Se há governo, eu gosto. Se há governo, eu gosto. Right? So the PMDB basically positions itself as a catch-all party in order to get pork from whatever, whatever force is in power at the federal level. So very weak political identities in Brazil. Okay? And this has been true for a very long time. Here's poll data going all the way back to 1987, between 1987 and 2010. These are some of the major parties up here, the PT in red, right? appropriate because it's a leftist party. But the big winner here is no preference. Okay? Consistent throughout. This is part of the political culture of Brazil. Brazilians have no preference for a particular political party. Only the PT, and the PT represents more than 50%, 55% of all party identifiers in Brazil, right? which is, which is uh, really shocking. In other words, it's a, it's a pretty weak political, political system. These are the presidents of Brazil. Um, and one of the things that I want to do in this talk is, is give you some kind of chronology, some sense of how to think about political and economic change in Brazil. Because in some ways, what I'm going to say is that there, this is a tale of two Brazils. The first Brazil uh, was the Brazil of these presidencies, Sarney, Collor, and Itamar Franco. Okay? All kind of interesting people. Um, Sarney is still involved in politics. He was the president of the Senate. He's now retired. Uh, his daughter, Josiana, is the uh, governor of the poorest state 
uh, in the north, uh, the state of Maranhão. So it's a family that has controlled politics in Brazil for a very long time. Sarney was not meant to be president. This is the first president to follow the military regime. Uh, the military decided that they, they could not handle the idea that Brazilians would elect their first president directly. So they created something that would limit their choices and would allow the military to control the group of politicians who would be able to compete for the presidency. Guess what that mechanism was? An electoral college. Mm. Yeah, electoral colleges are the mechanisms of authoritarian regimes that want to control democratic institutions. But, okay, we'll just leave that at that. Uh, Sarney was not elected president, he was the vice president. And he was selected to be on the ticket with Tancredo Neves. Neves was a politician from Minas Gerais State, old, old style politician, but a Democrat with a small d. And Sarney was selected because he was a friend of the armed forces. And so it was, his selection was meant to sort of calm their apprehensions about the transition to democracy. But the problem here was that Nevis died on the eve of the inauguration. Making, after 21 years of authoritarianism, Sarney, a friend of the military, became president. And of course, he, he didn't, was not able to control inflation. It was a total disaster. I'll just go through the, the history because you, don't re, you really don't need to know the details, but it, there are interesting details. Golan was elected in 1990. He beat out Lula. Okay. Lula runs for president four times, and he fails to win the presidency three of those times. Right? So there's something about his tenacity uh, that should be said. Guler is only able to serve for two years because he is uh, accused of campaign finance corruption. Remember, the money in campaign finance goes to individual politicians. Uh, Guler was able to use a kickback scheme. He, was, you know, he tried to buy the Congress. None of those things worked. He didn't have a political party that was part of his problem. He wasn't able to control, control any kind of majority in the Congress. So he is impeached. He's impeached by the end of 1992, making uh, his vice president, Itamar Franco, the president. So we have two accidental presidencies, Sarney and Itamar, and we have Kohler, an impeached president. So the first decade of democracy in Brazil made Brazil look incredibly incompetent. Right? The, the macroeconomists, talking about the, the economy, the macroeconomist Rudiger Dornbusch, the, the late Dornbusch, said that the, the, the Brazilian economy was drunk presumably on inflation. The, the political scientist Scott Mainwaring at uh, the University of Notre Dame called the party system a feckless democracy. Right? So it was just a, a country that if you studied it would just drive you absolutely insane, so I decided to study it. Um, one of the only things that Itamar Franco did was, that, was, that was lasting, that was good, was that he made this man, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, his finance minister. Cardoso had been the chief diplomat, had been the minister of foreign relations. He moved over to the ministry of the economy and he created a stabilization plan to deal with inflation. It was called a real plan. So if you, if you go to Brazil, you, you will use the currency reals, right? So they're basically royal currency, reals, or reais. Um, suffice to say that this plan did the trick. It brought inflation down, and I'll show you this. It, and this was no small thing. I mean, th this was a hyperinflationary economy. It was, it was terrible. Um, and, 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 and if you can deal with hyperinflation, you're going to get the support of the Brazilian people because instantly it produced value in the, in the pockets, literally in the pockets of poor people. So they, they could have, they could spend. So consumer spending increased. The economy did a bit better in 1995 and 1996. Cardoso was reelected in 1998. Again, his chief opponent was Lula, right? Lula in 94, couldn't beat him on the Real Plan, couldn't beat him again in 1998. So he led a social democratic party, which was sort of a catch-all party as well, a little bit more disciplined than the PMDB. It actually was an offshoot of the PMDB. Finally, Lula is elected president in October of 2002, and he takes the presidential sash in January of 2003. And then finally, we have Dilma Rousseff. So these last two presidents have been uh, presidents under the rubric of the Workers' Party. So the political system, at least at the presidential level, has revolved around competition between Cardoso's political family, the PSDB, the Social Democratic Party of Brazil, and the PT, the Workers' Party. Right? And we don't know if Dilma is going to get reelected. I can talk about that in the Q&A. Okay? So there are question marks there. 
This is the image of Brazil that The Economist said we should think about. This was, a, this was a few years ago. Brazil takes off. Here's Cristo Redentor, right? Cristo Corcovado in, in Rio. And recently, The Economist published this. <laughs> uh, not so quickly can we say that Brazil is ready to take off because there's some problems on the horizon. Um, some of the statistics I'm about to show you, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happened in the last year or so. The economy has really slowed down. Uh, some of the, the good things that Lula and Jilma were able to do, they met the IMF targets for uh, a surplus on the primary, uh, on the primary uh, uh, account. So they weren't running deficits. They had paid down the public debt. Public debt was starting to fall. Well, a lot of these things have now started to reverse. So public, public spending has really blossomed in Brazil. It's part of Jilma's um, organizing, sort of her, her governing philosophy, to really prime the pump of the Brazilian economy to try to get it going again. And she's doing a variety of things for the good and for the bad. And I can talk about some of, the, some of those um, in the Q&A and also a little bit in the, in the presentation. So we have, again, these two images of Brazil, either taking off or uh, engaged in the process of a crash landing. Um, so, what are the dimensions of the turnaround here? I'm going to talk a bit about the economy. I'm going to talk about governability. I mean, it has, with all these political parties, with no real identity and ideology except for the PT, has Brazil become a more governable uh, country? Um, I'll talk about social development, particularly poverty and inequality, and quality of democracy. Okay, and I'll, I'll give you the punchline. The punchline is that actually on the first three, there are very noticeable aspects uh, of a turnaround that are more positive than negative. There are some slowdowns in recent months, but I think more positive than negative. On the quality of democracy, I think there have been also some important um, improvements, but there are terrible limitations. And one of the interpretations of all these protests that blossomed during the summer is that they are a response to some of the contradictions of Brazilian democracy in terms of its quality. Okay, so let's talk about the economy a little quickly. Um, here are uh, annual inflation rates. Right? Like, so you see these hyper, hyperinflation here at the beginning of the 1990s, end of the 1980s, and then boom. Inflation has started to heat up again only in the past year, which scares Brazilians to death. Right? Young Brazilians don't have any memory, and people your age have no memory of the hyperinflationary period. Um, but Brazilians my age and older definitely remember the hyperinflationary period. So if inflation comes back in any serious way, and hyperinflation is 50% monthly inflation, all right, that's very, very high. Brazil is looking at about 7% annual inflation. That's still not great for Brazil. It was, it was down to, the, the average for the last decade has been about 4.5, uh, right? So that's not great for the U.S., but it's pretty good for Brazil, but 7% is a bit too high. And so the central bank and the Ministry of the Economy are tightening up the money supply, but at the same time, the government wants to spend in order to reflate the economy and try to get growth uh, uh, back. They're looking at a projected growth rate for the year on, of about 2%, which is terrible for a developing country, right? It should be closer to 7%, 6%. Um, they had 7.5% uh, uh, growth in 2010. Now, keep in mind, China's growing at 8%, right? 7%, 8%. Um, Brazil's got to get up to those, to those kinds of numbers, or uh, certainly above 5%, if it's, if it's going to do the things it wants to do. Um, here are the growth rates, all very, very volatile, but you can see they recovered very nicely after the financial crisis. By May of 2009, effectively, the, the, their, the economy was out of a recession. It was a very quick, quick recession in Brazil. Brazil was one of these few developing countries that was able to bounce back from the crisis of 2008, 2009. It did so in stunning fashion here, almost 8% growth rates uh, in 2010. But growth started to slow, and it's really now, as I said before, it's really creeping down under 2%, which is a, which is a real problem. Uh, here is uh, public debt. This was a real problem during the 1990s. It afflicted the Cardoso administration. Lula and Jilma, you know, keep, in, keep this in mind, we're talking about leftist presidents here, Lula and Jilma. And the expectation for a leftist president is that they're going to spend like crazy, right? They're going to spend like Italian governments. And they're not going to really care that much about the value of the currency, and they're going to run up deficits. Well, Lula and Jilma have not done that. Only in the last year has Jilma kind of let loose on the spending. And I can talk more about this. It's, it's, 
It's largely led by oil, right? You probably have read that Brazil in 2007 discovered what we now know to be 60 billion barrels of oil tucked down below two kilometers of salt beds off the coast of Rio de Janeiro. And the public oil company Petrobras is actively penetrating those salt beds to get to this oil. They are spending about $127 billion in order to do that. That is a larger investment in exploration than BP or Exxon or you name any of the large oil companies, Petrobras has got them beat. $127 billion is a huge chunk of change for oil exploration. But if there are 60 billion barrels down there um, and Brazil can start exporting oil as early as 2020, which is what I think the optimistic projection is, um, it's going to be very, very significant. But in the meantime, in order to keep Brazilians happy, Petrobras has been asked by the Jilma government to subsidize gasoline in domestic consumption. So they spend about 10 to $12 billion a year to subsidize the price of domestic oil. So unfortunately, under Lula, it became a self-sufficient economy in terms of energy. Brazil no longer had to import oil. Under Jilma, they're importing oil, and, and too much of it. Right, so, so that's the irony, but it's a big gamble that somehow the Olympics are gonna pay off for them and the oil is gonna pay off and they're, they're gonna get out of whatever debt they're, 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 uh, they're accumulating at this time. So, so this, this has uh, changed a little bit. There's going, uh, for the end of 2013, there's going to be a slight increase in uh, public debt as a percentage of the GDP. Foreign currency reserves, this is another amazing story and of course this is gonna become even bigger once they start exporting oil. Uh, they hold one of the largest reserves of foreign currencies, right? So we have, they have dollars, they have euro, they have yen, but primarily uh, a mixture of euro and dollars. This reserve of currency, I mean, it's nothing compared to China. China has almost three trillion dollars in reserves, all right? So this is, this is just about 400 billion dollars in reserves, but it makes Brazil the one, two, three, four, five, the fifth largest holder of U.S. treasuries in the world, okay? So just behind Caribbean banking centers, yuck, yuck, oil export, all oil exporters, Japan and China, right? And we know China's buying up a lot of our treasury notes, right? That's the debt that partially allows us to spend like Italian governments. Um, Brazil is in that list. It's holding more U.S. treasuries than Russia, Hong Kong, the United Kingdom, France, you know, a lot of advanced capitalist countries, right? So it's a, it's a significant player uh, in the world and that should interest us because they're holding a, a, a good part of, of, our, of our debt. Um, so what they decide to do is, is going to impact what happens here. Um, this is another way in which the Brazilian economy has changed. Uh, sorry for the very busy graph. This is just focused on exports between 1990 and 2001. And what I want to call your attention to is just in the last couple of years what's happened. Uh, you see that they have done most of their trade with the European Union. Not so much with the United States. Trade with the U.S. has really plummeted. In fact, Brazil and the U.S. have gone toe-to-toe -to -toe at the World Trade Organization quite a number of times. Brazil tends to sue the U.S. over their, you know, restrictive policies on steel because Brazil exports steel and oranges and tomatoes and some other things. And uh, the U.S. Uh, calls out Brazil on its industrial policies and its, um, its abuse of uh, intellectual property rights, especially in pharmaceuticals. Brazil started producing in the 1990s a bunch of retroviral, generic retroviral drugs to bring its incidence of AIDS down. It was very successful, by the way, but it violated patents. And so the Americans are still hot and bothered about that. But the relationship has really soured. It's really soured. And it's gotten, I think it's gotten, <clears throat> it's gotten worse in recent years uh, under Lula and, and Gilman. I can say more about that. But trade with the European Union has also fallen. It's trade with China that has really taken off. And this is a big part of, Bra of the Brazilian story. And you, you've probably read about the commodity boom in Latin America. Brazil is more than 50% of the Latin American commodity boom. Right? But trade is only 14% of the GDP of Brazil. Right? So it's the large domestic market and its exploitation of natural resources for domestic consumption uh, is still a very big part of its economy, 
much more so than trade is. To give you a comparison, Chile and Uruguay do more than 50% 50 50 of their GDP is, is trade. Right? Argentina, it's closer to 28%, 30%. Mexico, 30 35%. For Brazil, it's only 14%. But it's still very significant, the relationship with, uh, with, with China. So the economy has changed in crucial ways. It is, a, it is a country that not only is bringing in foreign direct investment, a lot of multinational corporations want to invest in Brazil, it's also now increasingly sending out foreign direct investment. Right, so you have Brazilian com companies like Petrobras, the National Development Bank, which is a public public firm making investments in neighboring Latin American countries. Uh, you have uh, contracting companies like Odebrecht building uh, railroads and buildings in Florida and California. Um, Embraer, obviously, is one of the big exporters. Vali, Vali is the uh, biggest iron ore exporter in the world. It is now buying up firms abroad. So some of this is mergers and acquisitions, but most of it is investments directly by Brazilian multinationals abroad. Right? So in the business literature, this is called the multi-Latina trend. And Brazil is more than half, half of that. Right, so again, if you want to talk about multinational investment, Brazil is a, is a necessary country. All right, so in terms of the economy, there are lots of indicators that suggest, yeah, there's something different going on here. Brazil does deserve to be the B in the BRICS. It's a significant country, and it's connected to the other BRICS, particularly China, in a way that's very compelling. Has it become politically a more governable country? Okay. Well, let me introduce you to a couple of Brazilian political scientists. Uh, Fernando Limonchi at the University of Sao Paulo and Argelina Figueiredo also at the University of Sao Paulo. In the middle of the 1990s when, when political scientists, American political scientists like Scott Mainwaring were saying that Brazil has a feckless political system, Rudiger Dornbusch was saying that the economy is drunk, Limonchi and Figueiredo were almost alone among political scientists in the world and even in Brazil and saying, well, we look at the data and actually we find that that's not really true. Uh, they looked at, they started to gather data on how politicians vote in the Chamber of Deputies, the lower house. And they found generally that politicians vote together with their party group. Not what you would expect to find in a, in a, in a political system in which people don't identify with political parties. So politicians shouldn't identify with political parties. They should only, you know, cultivate a personal vote. But they found, and congressly, that no, politicians were actually voting together as part of the same political family. This initiated a debate that's, that's been going on for at least 15 years now. And so critics of the Brazilian political system said, well, you know, what you're actually seeing is an optical illusion. People are voting with the same political groups because patronage is being distributed broadly within the same political families. Right? And, and so you had uh, American political scientists like Mainwaring and Barry Ames at the University of Pittsburgh that argued that. And the Brazilians came back and said, no, 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 the data actually show that there's more of an organization here. Limonji and Figueiredo pointed to this organization here, Colégio de Líderes, Council of Leaders. It's a group of political party leaders that in the Chamber of Deputies get together and decide what the docket of legislation should be. They decide on what's going to get voted uh, up or down. And what's important in their argument is that all of these votes are negotiated with the president. So that the president and the leaders of the Congress are actually collaborating on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, a number of political scientists began to see this as a permanent and stable and more governable system of rule for a presidential system. Now, we normally think of presidential systems as separation of powers. The president has to wait for the Congress, which has the power of the purse, to decide. The Congress legislates, and the president executes, right? Not in Brazil. 80% of all legislation that goes up for a vote in the Chamber of Deputies is designed by the presidency. So the presidency indirectly legislates, but the presidency also directly legislates through the use of these presidential decree authorities, medidas provisoris, or MPs. Okay? The MP is a complicated thing. It's, you can see it in the Constitution of 1988. They're only meant to be for emergencies, where a president assumes decree powers. If you've been reading the press, you know Nicolás Maduro in Venezuela just had the Congress pass a law that allows him to rule the country via decree for about 12 months or 13 months. Right? That's a much more powerful version of Medida Provisoria than you see in Brazil. In Brazil, a Medida Provisoria comes out of the presidency. It's a piece of legislation. The president says, I want this piece of legislation to pass. And the Congress has up to 60 days to vote up or down on it. 
if they, if they, and, and the, the, the thing is, is that if it's an MP, it goes straight up to the top of the docket. Now, what these political scientists have, have found is that over the years, the president just basically negotiated these MPs with the Colegio de Leaders, with the Council of Leaders. And so it was not necessary to even use a veto or the threat of a veto. Uh, they just basically you know, got together and made laws. Sounds interesting. Hmm. Maybe we should do something like that. Um, but it became a stable way of thinking about how presidents can legislate in Latin America and particularly in Brazil. Right, so these political scientists, all from Brazil, Sergio Abranches, who's now a political journalist, Octavio Amorim Neto, Carlos Pereira, Fabiano Santos, these young political scientists in Brazil uh, developed this theory of coalitional presidentialism. Okay? So while mostly North American political scientists were saying, eh, Brazil doesn't work, it's a dysfunctional country, it's a perverse democracy, it's a pathological democracy, as, as Barry Ames once said, these uh, Brazilian political scientists, who were trained mostly in the United States, by the way, okay, with using the same techniques of American political science, how we study the American political system, went back down to Brazil and said, well, it's, you know, our separation of power system it doesn't work like yours. Uh, and this is one of the important ways in which it deviates. So the, the end result is that it's a much more governable system, right? So after 1995, yeah, you can complain that they didn't pass pension reform or the pension reform that they did pass wasn't, uh, it didn't go far enough. Uh, some of the social policies haven't gone far enough. But the system has not flown out of control. Right. So the governability, arguably, of the system is a lot better off. Social development here, the turnaround is absolutely clear. Um, you have to keep in mind that Brazil is one of the most unequal countries in the world. It's up there with Guatemala, Chile, although Chile's got a little bit better since uh, uh, um, Bachelet was president. Um, Namibia is a very unequal country. I mean, it's up there with a, a Gini coefficient um, you know, well, as you'll see in, in the next slide, well over 0.5. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an indicator of the distribution, relative distribution of income. Poverty and inequality have come down in Brazil. And the timing is very important. If you look at the year in which you see this uh, beginning of this downward slope in the poverty rate, it coincides with the election of, um, of Lula. Okay, so under leftist governments, Brazil has done a lot better in terms of poverty. Now, there's a very intense debate in Brazil about whether it's the, it's the PT presidents that did this or it's some of the innovative social policies that, that began under Fernando Henrique Cardoso. I'm agnostic on this question. I think it's just, that's too ideological and too partisan a debate in Brazil, and I'm not a Brazilian. So I just say a pox on both your houses. I'd rather understand this historically. And I think both, both arguments are actually correct. A lot of these ideas began under Fernando Henrique Cardoso, and I'll, I'll talk about the most important one, the Bolsa Familia, in just a minute. Here's uh, the Gini coefficient, okay? And if you compare this performance on Gini, as Gini goes down, the distribution of income is becoming more equal, all right? So at zero, the distribution of income is perfect. Everybody has the same. At one, one person has all the income. Right. So, so this is one of the ways in which we can do cross-national comparisons on income inequality. This movement in inequality on the Gini coefficient, you just don't find this in the developing world very much. This kind of movement, this rapid uh, recession in Gini is, is extremely rare. And it has never happened in Brazilian history. Right. So this is a very unusual, and again, it coincides roughly with the election of Lula and later the continuation of social policies under Gilma. One of the social policies that I want to talk about is Bolsa Familia, because you've probably done some reading about this. Bolsa Familia is essentially a monthly cash payment to poor families, to poor households that qualify. Uh, it's a conditional, it's one of these things called a conditional cash transfer. The cash payment is conditional on three things. That the household, which has children, must make sure that those children attend school. If there's a pregnant woman, it can be a daughter, it could be the female head of the household, doesn't matter. If there's a pregnant woman in the household, that she receive regular prenatal care, and that all children receive the regular vaccination schedule. If you look at medical health statistics for the last 10, 15 years in Brazil, they are much better. 
Right? There are a number of neglected tropical diseases that still spring up and become a problem, but NTDs are always that, that kind of thing. AIDS rates are way down. Uh, diarrhea, killing children, infant mortality, that's way, way down in comparison to what, where they were in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So Bolsa Familia is just one of these very innovative uh, policies that have been used. In, the, in this map, you can see the concentration of families that receive Bolsa Familia, it tends to go to the poorest states of the North and Northeast and the Amazonian region, which is sparsely populated. But the North and Northeast, really the coastal areas are the more heavily populated areas, and some large cities up there, but they tend to be very, very poor. Right, the poorest states in Brazil. And so I show you this map just to leave you with the impression that the money is actually going to the poor. And, and there have been studies after studies after studies on, on using very rigorous quantitative methods that show, yep, if you correlate the human development index at, the, at a municipal level with uh, the distribution of uh, Bolsa Familia monies, you get the inverse relationship that you would expect. So where human development is high, Bolsa Familia funding is low, right? So the money's not going to the rich, it's going, it's going to the poor. So very important policy, but it hasn't been enough, right? It's helped to reduce poverty. It's, it's done something to improve on inequality. We're still, there's still a little bit more of a debate about that. Um, but definitely in terms of poverty, it's, it's really gotten uh, things on a roll. In terms of the quality of democracy, here there's a mixed bag, as I suggested earlier. Um, in many ways, Brazilian democracy functions better because there's more oversight. I'm going to talk a little bit about corruption because that's a, that's a topic that's near and dear to my heart and I teach about corruption, not how to do it, but how to understand it. Um, there's clearly, as you can see from the coalitional presidentialism stuff, there's clearly much more presidential legislative cooperation. That doesn't just help governability, it also means that there's oversight, right? More and more oversight. But that doesn't avoid corruption entirely. The most important case of corruption in recent years blew up in the summer of 2005 before Lula was reelected in 2006. It was called the monthly retainer. Uh, the Brazilians simply called it the big monthly retainer or the mensalão. Essentially, it was a vote buying scheme that was run out of the presidential palace not by Lula, supposedly. He did the Reagan thing, I don't remember. Uh, it was uh, managed by the president of the Workers' Party and the chief of staff of the presidency. Okay, so very, very serious charges. They basically distributed money in um, um, briefcases, in all kinds of things. The, there was a guy who was caught at the airport with $200,000 in his underwear. I kid you not, $200,000 in his underwear. And the money was traced back to this, to, to this scheme. Part of the problem here was that in order to get votes in the Congress, if you don't have political parties that are allied to you, right, ideologically or whatever, you know, they need something. They, they want to get, they, they basically want to be bought in order to provide their votes. They went too far with this. The Mensalon scandal um, and kickback schemes at a local level really tarnished the reputation of the Workers' Party for clean government. Okay? Um, and Lula survived it, but the, the people at, in the Workers' Party who were responsible for the scheme were tried before the Supreme Court, which is the only place where politicians may be tried, not at the lower courts, but only at the Supreme Court. They were found guilty just about a year ago. That's 2000, 2012. The scheme happened in 2005. So it's, it's been a long time coming, and they finally, we, we believe, they're finally going to go to jail. Right? So justice is extremely slow in Brazil, especially when it comes to politicians, and I'll say more about this in just a moment. The parliament, the Congress, can, uh, has, has oversight powers, has these committees to investigate um, political crimes. I can say more about those in the Q&A. There's this national office called the Ministerio Público, and it is a very professional highly professional organization, and, the, and it has state-level uh, offices. Basically, what they do is they, they investigate all kinds of um, uh, accusations of uh, malfeasance, official malfeasance, um, campaign finance malfeasance. Very, very important. And then you have federal and state auditors, also highly professional. A lot of these college-educated young people in urban areas that are protesting, a lot of these people will eventually work for the Ministerio Público and the state auditors. One can only hope, right? They, they are the very class 
of people that we want to see in these kinds of institutions. You have to take a civil service exam in order to get in, and once you're in, especially with the MP, you're in for life. They have tenure, right? So you're protected. You get job security, and the salary is pretty good. And then we have this organization, the Federal Police. I think they're really interesting, and I'll say something more about them because they're interesting. The Federal Police is our DEA, our FBI, our uh, immigration services, the ICE, right? all tucked into one agency of mostly 5,800 officers, the federal police. These are the people that greet you at the international airport in Rio and Sao Paulo, who will check your bags, and these are the people you do not want to mess with. They cannot be bribed. They are untouchable, and there's been no case of a federal police officer engaging in corruption. That's not to say it hasn't really happened, but haven't, haven't, haven't seen it happen. The federal police have, have really increased their investigations of all kinds of official malfeasance and crimes. And you can see this in the, in the graphic, federal police investigative operations between 2003 and 2009. You know, the thing about Brazilians is that, like I said before, they love to laugh, right? And they take their job very seriously when they're trying to root out corruption, but they still, you know, want to laugh a little bit. Right. So the federal police has named their operations after a number of different things, and I think you'll enjoy this. So, for example, a cyber crime operation called Control Alt Delete, Operation Pendrive, Operation Trojan Horse, Operation Freud dealt with social security fraud based on false claims of mental incapacity, human trafficking, Operation Aphrodite, Operation Bye Bye Brazil, for those of you who like the film, Operation Sodom and Exodus. They love biblical, you know, the Hebrew Bible, of course. Uh, public payroll fraud in the state of Roraima in the north, Operation Egyptian Plague. Environmental regulators illegally trafficking in lumber. Isn't that nice? Operation Pinocchio. And my favorite, public officials selling ambulance services, Operation Leeches, Sangesugas. This, this is a typical thing. If, if a local politician, a political family, demands the vote of a poor group of people, they say, you know, if you vote for us, you see, there, you know, some of these towns are very small towns and sparsely populated, and there's only one ambulance, and the hospital's in the city. So the incumbent mayor will say, that ambulance gets parked in front of the mayoral palace or the office or my house. And if you voted for me, maybe your sister will get access to that ambulance if something happens to her. You know, that's the way that, unfortunately, politics in the interior, especially in countries like Brazil, can often happen. And this was a, this was a huge, huge scheme um, that was uh, blown open. Illegal sale of blood products by the Ministry of Health, Operation Vampire. I mean, this is, um, you know, the important thing is that they're getting serious about this. Yes and no. <laughs> Again, with the yes and no. Okay, so if you look at this, this is a list of public officials that have been sent to prison. They've gone through the whole process. And they finally got convicted, and they finally are doing time, right? What I want to uh, point out here is that there's a big difference between those public officials that are appointed, or they're just simply civil servants, and those public officials that are elected. Very few elected public officials are doing time in Brazil, okay? So it's only been very recently that the people at the very top of the Mensalon scandal are starting to see time. So there's this problem that Brazilians talk about. They, they talk about it as the problem of official impunity, right? That if you are someone, a big muckety-muck in politics, the law just simply doesn't apply to you. There's an old 19th century saying about the two Brazils, the Brazil that applies to the elite and the Brazil that applies to the rest of the population, the poor. All right, that that problem still, unfortunately, continues. So, so there are softer forms of corruption. I, I, I can talk about the parliamentary investigative committees, that oftentimes those have also been politicized. So think of them as uh, investigatory committees in, the, in our own House and Senate that get politicized by the presidency. Lula tried to stop the one that was investigating the men's alone. He didn't, he didn't want it to come together, and, and he, almost, he almost got away with it. He almost stopped it. Um, but um, it, there was just simply too much public heat on this question. Vote buying, the Mensalon scandal, um, kickback schemes in local government, what's called Caixa Dois, or second till. The second till is a second cash box. So that's, that's just simply a kickback scheme where a contractor will gain a public contract, 
if you don't think this is going on with the World Cup preparations and the, and the I mean, they are going to the Super Bowl of Cajadois at this point. Uh, this is going on all the time, and, and it's, uh, it's very unfortunate. And it leads to a lot of misuse of public resources. And this is, you know, just a couple of cases like this hit the paper and people go to the streets. They just protest. They're so, they're angry and, and tired of this. Campaign finance, uh, the role of friends and family, I can say more about that later. And then the judiciary is a total mess. Backed up dockets, there's no real system of precedent, of stare decisis, as we call it. Um, so upper, upper courts make decisions and they don't apply to the lower courts. Uh, there was an important judicial reform in 2004 that, that helped deal with some of that, but it, it just has not, has not really been uh, sufficient. I can say more about that later. So, to conclude, is it a serious country? Is Brazil a serious country at last? It's a, it's a complicated country. I mean, definitely, Tom Jobim, the great uh, Brazilian composer, he fa famously said, Brazil, it's not for beginners. It isn't. It's a complicated, contradictory country. But the economic and social dimensions of the turnaround definitely, definitely are real. The question is, are they sustainable? And more importantly, can we go deeper? Can we see a much stronger, uh, you know, re reduction in inequality? And I think the ultimate question is, can we move more Brazilians from informality? 50% of the labor market is informal, from informality to formality. Uh, very important question. Governability. Governability certainly has improved, but again, it, it involves too many sort of flaky, non-institutional relationships between certain presidents and certain leaders of the parties in the Congress. And when the personalities change, that becomes a real, that becomes a real problem. I, I had the privilege a couple of weeks ago to sit down with Senator Tim Kaine from Virginia. His son goes to Carleton. And uh, we had a, a wonderful conversation about how the Senate is running these days. And he said something that I just absolutely floored me. He said, you know, when I first came to the Senate, I was, I, I was you know, still the junior senator from Virginia because Mark Warder is the senior senator. I thought that 80% of what I, see in, what I would see in the Senate would be ideological. It's all ideology, right? He says, now I'd say maybe 30% of it is ideological, 70% of it is personal. Personal. It's personalities. It's kind of shocking and somewhat discouraging. Um, when you think about it. The quality of democracy. I mean, in many ways, the quality of democracy has gotten better. There's, there are more systems of accountability. There's more oversight. But as I pointed out just a couple of minutes ago, there's still a lot of areas that need to be improved. And I can say more about the quality of the vote and the meaning of participation in the Q&A. So here's Chiririca to say muito obrigado, very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I stand for your questions. Um, we're now, I'm going to leave him to uh, identify folks uh, that have questions. Uh, we'll do this, uh, I promise you, we will do this for 20 minutes and the program will finish at uh, 10 minutes uh, of the hour. So please stay with us. So the field is open for your questions. And I'll give Stand in the middle. You mean green environment? You mean, yeah, right. right, right. Um, deforestation rates fell in the last 10 years. That has been a piece of very good news. Um, there's been a slight uptick. I mean, the last year has not been a good year. Um, there has been a slight uptick in deforestation rates, but for the first time since the early 70s when the equivalent of Brazil's NASA, uh, which manages the satellite system, started, you know, they, they started back in the 70s to, to measure deforestation rates. It's, it's only been in the last 10 years that we've actually seen a reduction. Environmental regulations that are on the books are the strongest that Brazil has ever had. The problem is enforcement. How do you find, you know, the causes of deforestation? And, and there are other kinds of environmental problems. Urban pollution is awful. Uh, in a place like Sao Paulo, even in Rio. I mean, we're going to see this when, when the Olympics are, are, are in Brazil. You're going to see a lot of these contradictions, and the rest of the world is going to wonder, 
wow, I can't make sense of this country. There are just so many odd things, some, some wonderful things, a lot of wonderful things, and then, and then they do this stuff with the environment. So that's, you can see that. Um, the regulatory structure is not the story. The story is enforcement. Um, Brazil has signed on to every single major international environmental treaty. Uh, Mercosur, the, the uh, market of the south uh, that has, that counts Argentina, Uruguay, uh, Chile as an observer, um, as members, and now Venezuela as, as a member. It used to have Paraguay, but Paraguay was uh, kind of kicked out because it didn't want Venezuela in. Mercosur has environmental protocols. Brazil accepted them. In fact, Brazil embraced these environmental protocols in the 1990s when the common market was being created. So in terms of actually having laws and signing laws, Brazil has embraced all of this. But in terms of enforcement, the empirical question, it's been very uneven, very uneven. Um, I can talk about a little bit about uh, indigenous Brazilians. There are only about 250,000 of them. Uh, their access to land was guaranteed. Very really early on in the democracy, Gola gave uh, indigenous Brazilians a huge swath of the Amazon, but very few people re respect it. Miners go in and they traipse all over the rights of indigenous peoples, uh, sometimes killing. I mean, murder, the murder rate in the Amazon is very high, partly because of that. Um, so again, the story is, is enforcement. With the extraction of oil, and the expansion, the rapid expansion of mining, especially in the Amazonian region, in the Carajás region, the environmental de devastation has been, um, has been worse. There's a huge dam project, the Belo Monte Dam, that Jilma is absolutely behind and she wants to build it. It's going to be almost as large as the Three Gorges. The Three Gorges will still be the largest, but Belo Monte will be the second largest in the world. And that's with Itaipu. They already have Itaipu. They've had Itaipu since the 70s. I've, I've, I've visited Itaipu, but Itaipu does not, um, does not uh, uh, devastate the environment the way that Belo Monte is going to. So that, that is an issue that you should read about. What's going to happen with the Belo Monte project? That's going to be terrible. Then what's going to happen with offshore oil? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of potential there for, uh, for abuse, um, given all the money that they're focused upon. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Brazil has always had what they call an independent foreign policy, right? Since the beginning of the 20th century. There was a baron by the name of Rio Branco, very important figure in Brazilian history. And Rio Branco believed that Brazil's foreign policy had to have two things. He was foreign minister in the 19 teens. Uh, it had to be independent. That is, it could, Brazil could not accept other countries telling it what to do. But at the same time, it had to have a close and positive relationship with the United States. You'll know that Brazil was the only Latin American country that sent troops to World War II. They fought in Italy. Right? One of the unintended consequences of that was that the foreign expeditionary force of Brazil uh, was, was devastated. They, didn't, they, they strategically made lots of mistakes. Uh, the, Brazilian, the Americans had to go in and bail them out. That did not look very good. The Brazilian sensibility was strained and stressed when these officers came back to Brazil. And the seeds of authoritarianism were partially planted by this because the military decided that they had to really professionalize the armed forces. And so they created elite um, military academies to try to really boost the training of their officers. They started training their officers in economics, um, administration. And that later in the 1960s, these, these officers believed that they could run the country. And so they took power. Right? And even during that time, you know, the, the, the foreign policy tended to be, again, uh, it's tended to follow the sort of independence from the United States. It has become, especially under Lula, um, less so under Jilma, that tendency in Brazilian foreign policy became a little bit distorted. Lula had a more grandiose vision for the country. He believed that the US, for example, was doing nothing constructive in the Middle East. Now, Brazil should have no role to play in the Middle East. It has no history of being in the Middle East, except for the military period where Brazilians sold tanks 
and armored vehicles to the Saudis. And remember the Scud missiles in the uh, first war with Iraq? Brazilian. Uh, those were constructed in Brazil. It was Brazilian technology. So that's, that was the only association that Brazil had with the Middle East, and it was not really very good. So who was Lula to tell the Americans and the Israelis what to do? Lula went ahead and talked to Ahmadinejad and brought the Iranian president to Brazil, which was a total slap in the face to Washington. Now, previous Brazilian presidents had never tried to do anything like that, to step on the toes of the US in terms of the security argument. In terms of economic policy, there was always tension with the United States because they're two large markets. They have interests in the world. They sue each other at the World Trade Organization. That's normal. But security, normally, Brazilians after 9-11 said that they would follow you know, the war against terror, all of that, fine. But this business with the South-South ties and bringing Ahmadinejad to Brazil was really an affront to the United States. Jilma has walked that back until the NSA crisis, okay? The NSA crisis is something about uh, Edward Snowden. He was interviewed by this journalist, this American journalist from The Guardian. That journalist lives in Rio. And, you know, it wasn't uh, hard for him to, to expand his inquiry you know, when he talked to Snowden, tell me about Latin America. <laughs> and all kinds of documents have been released in recent months about American spying. We've heard about the stuff in Europe, which is very embarrassing. But the stuff in Latin America is also very embarrassing. Jilma's conversations with her ministers uh, were, were tapped, okay? That's, that is a, a shock. I mean, there's a debate over whether we actually listen into to Angela Merkel uh, her cell phone conversations. There's still some debate about that. There's no debate about what happened with Jilma. We did that. And, and Jilma was actually quite upset. Even before the scandal erupted, she was very upset because she didn't get a state dinner when she was invited to the White House. And so finally, when the Obama administration offered her a state dinner a couple of months ago, she said, thank you, but no thank you. I won't even go. So, so the relationship has become very, very strained. And arguably, Jilma, more than Lula, has been more open to the prospects of improving relations with the US. But now, after the NSA scandal, I think that really goes out the window. It's a very sensitive time in US-Brazilian relations and US-Mexican relations and everybody else we spied on. It's moderate. You know, uh, population growth has really fallen um, as, the, as the economy has become bigger and household incomes have increased. Brazilians have fewer children. The average size of a family is four. So that's commensurate with some other middle income countries in advanced capitalist, uh, in the advanced capitalist world. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's lower. Yeah, it's lower. It's lower. It's worse. So let me follow up with that question. Mm -hmm. Devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. All right. So you argue that the US has to look at this from all the different perspectives. How about just hypothesis? Are those that brings down inflation, mm -hmm. huge macroeconomic spending mm -hmm. impacts, mm -hmm. both on oil growth mm -hmm. and higher oil exports. Mm -hmm. What else is there behind these arguments? Domestic market consumption. Uh, one of the limitations on Brazilian growth right now is that Brazilians have tapped out their credit lines. During the commodity boom, there was a lot of spending on credit. Uh, they're getting to the end of that. Um, unemployment is at a very low level. It's only about 4.5%. We would like to have 4.5%. So it's not unemployment that's dealing with this. There are plenty of jobs. Uh, there's plenty of demand for skilled labor. Um, but part of the problem is domestic consumption is slow right now compared to what it was during the commodity boom. There's a, obviously a drop in Chinese demand. Um, there's been a drop in demand for manufactured goods. Only half of Brazil's exports are commodities. It's actually, I mean, a lot of people will say, well, of course Brazil's growth should slow because the commodity boom has become a commodity bust in Latin America. But that, that doesn't really explain most of the story. 
If you look at the export bundle of Brazil, it's, it's, it's largely manufactured goods, a lot of agro-industrial products, um, increasingly products that require, and this is very interesting, intellectual property rights protections. Right? Uh, Brazil is one of the world's biggest investors today in GMOs, in genetically modified organisms, in agriculture. Most of that is focused on seeds, not so much, you know, they're not, they're not pumping hormones into cows. They have the largest cattle herd on the planet. All of their, all of their beef is grass-fed. It's not, it's not that part of it. It's not the ranching economy. It's the agro-industrial economy. So they're competing with, I mean, Monsanto is there. They're competing with the likes of Monsanto. Um, increasingly, that is going to put pressure on the Brazilian posture on intellectual property rights. They're going to, they're probably going to stand with the United States and Europe much more consistently. Uh, their economy is changing, and some piece of it is this kind of high tech economy that relies on highly skilled labor that the Brazilian universities have no problem producing. One of Jilma's most uh, ballyhooed educational uh, projects was Science Without Frontiers, it's called. And the whole idea was to send, is to send 100,000, listen, as a college president, you might be interested, 100,000 highly trained Brazilian students to American and West European universities to study STEM areas. Undergraduates? Undergraduates, yeah. Undergraduates and graduates, yep, yep. Uh, STEM. STEM, so science, science, engineering, math, computer science, yeah. So th there's a huge emphasis on that. And, and they've, they've poured a lot of money into it, and they certainly have the money uh, to do it. So where that's going to go, I mean, those investments pay off in a generation. Other questions? Well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not up on all the studies that, that look at the economic effects of Olympics, but from what I understand, from what I've read over the years, is that the effect is invariably negative. <laughs> right? Barcelona lost money, London lost money, Beijing lost money, but it didn't really matter because they had a lot of money. Brazil's going to lose money. And I think that, you know, the Brazilians, they know that. <laughs> they know that. It's not about the money they're going to lose, really. It's, it's about being at the center of global attention. It's to go back to this question about how Brazilians think about their relationship with the United States and how they see themselves, how they see each other. One of the unknowns about, known unknowns, about what's going on in Brazil with the protests is the real question is, will the protests occur with the World Cup, accompanying the World Cup? It's one thing to do it a year before. It's a different thing to do it when the world is looking at Brazil or the Olympics, right? It's going to be worse with the Olympics. And have these mass protests be the story, right? A lot of us who study Brazil tend to say, I'd say safely, most of us are going to say, that may be a bridge too far for Brazilians to protest and potentially damage the image of the country during these unique opportunities. So I think that there is going to be a consensus, if it isn't emerging already, that the World Cup and the Olympics, um, that their real value is going to be to showcase the country. And it's not an opportunity to criticize the country, certainly not from within. On the other side of the coin, there's going to be a lot of external criticism of Brazil. Brazilians are not used to that. <laughs> they're highly nationalistic. I'd say they're the most nationalistic Latin Americans outside of Cuba, because <laughs> I know the Cubans very well, very nationalistic. Brazilians are number two. Brazilians don't like foreigners to criticize them. You have to be very careful when you're in Brazil. I, you can talk to academics. And when I'm with my academic friends, uh, we go back and forth. Yeah, this perverse political system and all of that, ha, ha, ha. But when you're talking to business people, just regular uh, people in the service sector, they're offended if a foreigner attacks them. 
So as a Brazilianist, I'm going to be very interested to see how the country has matured in its relationship to the rest of the world and how they see, how they see Brazil being viewed by the rest of the world. And so in those terms, the money that will be lost, I'm sure it'll be an issue. I'm sure that political opponents of Dilma will try to make hay. But by that time, she will already have been reelected. So it won't really matter very much. And you can't really use those things to attack the PT because people aren't really voting for the party anyway. They're voting for the individual. So I think that's what she's banking on. I think the, if the Brazilian national selection wins the World Cup, she could win in the first round. I'll say that right now. If they're in the finals, maybe. If they kind of, you know, flub it, uh, then uh, it might not be. You know, Brazilians will be in an ordinary mood. They'll be more willing to listen to her opposition, which is mostly on her left flank, not on her right. The conservatives are just completely disorganized. The opposition's going to come from the left. It's going to be a more extreme left, a more of an environmental left, although that issue doesn't really resonate very much with Brazilian voters. Um, certain wedge issues will be put out there um, that will tarnish Jilma. Um, but you know, I, I think uh, she could survive it. Um, but it's an open question how these protesters are going to behave when the spotlight is on Brazil. It's going to be an interesting thing to see play out. Yes. You know, he's a real, he's a good politician. If, if he, uh, New York Times profiled him some months ago. If you search for Chidi Ika in the New York Times, you'll find him. Um, it's a, it was a great interview because um, he's a reflective guy. He's made a lot of money, so he doesn't have to answer to anybody, right? And he says that the whole place is a circus. Right, <laughs> the Brazilian politics is a circus, and it's uh, and he's he's been honest, and he feels that the rest of the political class is largely dishonest. I mean, it was a it was an interview that exposed a lot of popular perceptions of Brazilian of the Brazilian political class. But somebody like Fernando Limongi or Argelina Figueiredo or any of these other Brazilian serious Brazilian political scientists would say that that's not really what happens. Now, the whole political class is not, uh, you know. Uh, with your hands in a cookie jar. But um, there are quite a few that are. And corruption is uh, more systemic than we would uh, imagine, that we would, you know. But the system works pretty well compared to where they were during the first 10 years of democracy when they had a president that was impeached. And that kind of instability. You know, there, were, there was, I was in Brazil in 1993, in the summer of 93, when Itamar Franco was president. There were rumors that the military wanted back in that there was a coup being planned. That's, I, I think that was really uh, not true at the time, but there were a lot of rumors about it because Itamar just looked completely incompetent and the country was hapless. They had had a very sad story, probably uh, uh, read about it, the, the massacre of Candelaria outside the cathedral, the Roman uh, Catholic cathedral in Rio. Uh, seven street children were gunned down by off-duty police officers, and that was... Uh, um, there was a huge national outcry about that. And, and that, w that happened in July of 1993, and it was just the <coughs> lowest point in the history of democracy in Brazil. And, nobody, and then there were these rumors of a coup and so on. So compared to that, they're a lot better off today than they were back then. Uh, you know, yeah, what, what, what uh, Gary's referring to is the fact that the PT, the Mensalone scandal, the vote buying scandal, in, in, was uh, intended to pass legislation that was badly needed, okay? And that the people who were directly involved did not, uh, were not personally enriched by it. Um, 
Academics can make that distinction. <laughs> Journalists and regular educated Brazilians don't make that distinction, and certainly undereducated Brazilians don't make that distinction. The, the accusation of corruption is uh, potentially, and I say, I underscore potentially, potentially a bad thing. Okay? We've actually had plenty of political scientists, uh, uh, David Samuels at the University of Minnesota has done a study on this, uh, looking at politicians that have been accused of corruption, do they win re-election in the next electoral cycle? And essentially the results show that they have more than a 50% chance of winning re-election. <laughs> so the accusation of corruption by itself, even when it involves personal enrichment, or if it doesn't involve personal enrichment, is not a killer. It's not a killer because you can still make the argument that, hey, I can still do things for the electoral district or for the state. Right? And this is an old tendency in Brazil. There was a, a, a governor of Sao Paulo, Ajimar de Barros, who was uh, elected twice as governor. And his supporters, keep this in mind, his supporters put together campaigns, the famous campaign statement, he steals, but he gets things done. Uh, in Portuguese, rouba mas faz, rouba mas faz. And I've done some work with uh, surveys in Brazil. There's a, 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 a famous survey that, that, that a lot of us in political science use in Latin America, the LA POP surveys that are, that are done by Vanderbilt University. Um, and I, I've used the LA POP data for, you know, you can find survey items that ask pretty much the rouba mas faz phenomenon. And it's a lot stronger in the poor states of the north and northeast than it is in the, in the urban, industrialized, developed states of the South and Southeast. So poor, the poorer you are, the more likely you're going to say, well, he's a dishonest politician, but they're all like that. But he still gets things done. Yeah, so, so you can steal, but just make sure you build the bridge, you build the school, you put people to work. And I have, in my own field work, I have sat in the political offices of quite a few politicians, particularly in the poor states in the Northeast. And so, when you go to the Workers' Party office, it's kind of boring <laughs> because it's all, you know, the campaign paraphernalia is there and the program is there and basically what the paper says, what the program is, is what they do. And so they talk to you about their program. I mean, okay, that's great. It's somewhat inspiring. Okay, great. When you go to the offices of conservative and populist politician, what you hear is not, no, they don't talk about ideology. There's Forget it, people can't eat ideology. You, you sit in the waiting room and you listen to people want to speak with the president of the party or the general secretary of the party and they'll, and the conversation, and I overhear, I eavesdrop a lot on these conversations. I think this is IRB approved, but anyway. I listen to these conversations, it's always, oh, uh, president of the party, you know, they'll call them by their first name, Rafael, uh, I voted for you in the last electoral cycle, I voted for our, our federal deputy, my sister, uh, has, has grown sick and we don't know what she has and we need to get her to the hospital or um, I have a sick cow. Um, is there something that you can do for me? And, and the response usually is, oh, we know you voted for us. We know that you, you've supported us. Of course we're gonna take care of the cow or take care of your sister. That's the nature. It's, it's, a, it's an exchange of material, of material goods. And you would say, well, how do, the, how do these politicians know that the voters had actually voted the way they say they voted, right? Isn't the vote secret? It is secret. Well, the more research you do, the more you discover what actually happens. There's something called declared choice. Uh, voters, because they expect to get a material reward, they need to signal the politician that they voted for the candidate that they're supposed to vote for. So what they do is they take campaign paraphernalia, stickers and stuff like that, posters, and the flag of whatever party the politician supposedly represents, and they put those stickers on their person and they put them all over their door. So the political operative, the boss of the district, will walk around and make note of how people have declared their choice before the election even occurs. So they know who to reward later. That's how politics works on, on the ground floor.